Bree handed over the evidence bag, and I took it reluctantly. Inside was a handmade postcard. One side was black, with a large, bright green letter X, and what looked like a degraded close-up of an old typewriter font. On the other side, in letters clipped from magazines, ransom note style, were the words, The truth is out there. The X-Files. Bree said what I was already thinking. Tagline from the TV show. The truth is out there. We don't know if this murder was based on a particular episode, but it might have been. The same killer, I said. Has to be him. Supposedly this guy was white. Older, too, in his fifties or sixties, said Samson. I swept my arm around the stage. You've got a dozen expert witnesses to talk to here. If anyone can recognize makeup, it's going to be actors. Two murders based on specific source material, though. Both with some kind of calling card left behind for us to find. Different methods, Bree said. Could be coincidence. I'm not saying it is, but could be. Maybe there's more than one perp? Possibility. We've got a unifying signature, Bree. Public executions in front of an audience. Maybe we ought to call him the audience killer. That's the heart of it for him. Audience killer? Is that in the DSM-4? Samson's smile was grim. He coped through humor. A lot of homicide cops did, myself included. Bree ran a hand over the top of her head. I'm with you all the way, but... But what? Richter. Thor the Boar isn't going to let me rule out any possibilities without further cause. What about the ones that make perfect sense to rule out? I asked. This was the kind of bureaucratic logjam I associated with my time at the FBI, not Metro. Things sure had changed since I'd been away. Or maybe it was just me who had changed. I sighed out loud, looked around the stage. What else do we have? Chapter 29 I took my work home that terrible night and this wasn't even my case. Yet. It was two in the morning, and I already had the makings of a revised profile spread out on the kitchen table in front of me. I couldn't get the audience killer, as we now thought of him, out of my head. Or Kyle Craig, for that matter. What the hell did he want with me? Why was he making contact now? When the light under Nana's door came on, I flipped the pages over so she wouldn't see them as if a bunch of upside-down paper wouldn't look suspicious to her, or could fool the old night owl in the slightest. You hungry? was the first thing she said. It had been a long time since she'd asked what I was doing up in the middle of the night. A few minutes later, she had a couple of grilled apple and cheddar sandwiches going on the stove, half for her and one and a half for me. I cracked a beer and poured a small amount into a juice glass for her. What's on those pages there that you don't want me to see? She asked, her back still to me. Could it be your last will and testament? That's supposed to be funny? Not at all, sonny boy. Not funny in the least. Just sad. Very sad. She put down our plates and sat across from me at the kitchen table. Just like it had been for years. I don't think you're going to like what I have to say. I told her. And that stopped you when? I've been in private practice for a while. It's been good for me, the change. I like it most days. Nana bowed her head and clucked a couple of times. Oh, Alex, I'm not going to like this one bit. Maybe I should go back to my room and sleep. But, I said, then corrected myself. And... Something's missing for me. Mm-hmm. I'll bet. Getting shot at and missed. Getting shot at and hit. I didn't know what she could have done to make this easier, but she sure wasn't trying. I left law enforcement for some good reasons. Yes, you did, Alex. They're all sleeping upstairs. Nana, I've never been someone who works for a paycheck. My work, for better or worse, is part of me. And part of me is missing lately. 
That's just the way it is. I can't say I haven't noticed. But I'll tell you something else. There's a lot of other things missing around here these days. Things like phone calls in the middle of the night. Things like wondering when you'll be home again. If you'll be home again. We went back and forth like that for a while. The thing that surprised me was that the longer it went on, the stronger I felt about what I needed to do. Finally, I pushed back from the table and wiped my hands on a paper napkin. You know what, Nana? I love you dearly. I've tried keeping the peace. I've tried doing things your way, and whether or not it shows, it's not working. I'm going to live my life the way I have to. Oh, for heaven's sake. What does that even mean? She asked as she threw her hands into the air. I stood up. My heart was racing. Whatever it means, I'll let you know when it's done. I'm sorry, but that's as much as I can give you right now. Good night. I turned and walked away from her. Her laughter stopped me. It was just a soft chortle at first, the kind of feather that can knock you over, though. I turned back again, and something in my expression sent her into a full, cackling belly laugh. What? I finally had to ask. Nana gained control of herself, mostly, and slapped both hands down on the kitchen table. Well, look who's back from the dead. Alex Cross. Chapter 30 It was business as usual the next day, or maybe I should say business as unusual. Samson and I were canvassing the neighborhood around the Kennedy Center that afternoon when Bree called. You will not be sorry if you drop whatever you're doing and come back over here. She hung up without a hello or goodbye. What happened? Samson must have seen the confusion on my face. Something. That's all I know. Let's go. We found Bree parked at a computer terminal when we got to the office. Please tell me we didn't come back here to play solitaire, Samson said. Guess who's got a blog, Bree said. I actually got a call from a reporter on this. She didn't even know it was the first time I was hearing about it. She sat back to make room as we crowded in. The homepage she showed us was both simple and impressive. It had an all-black background with white writing. In the upper left corner, there was an animated graphic of a television set with what looked like live static on the screen. White block letters that read, My Reality, faded up, then out, then back again, like credits on a TV show. Underneath that, there were menu options for Channel 1, Channel 2, down through Channel 8. Weblog entries took up the bulk of the page, with the most recent one on top. It was marked for 12.30 a.m., only 14 hours prior. The title on it was simply, Thanks. Death is more universal than life. Everyone dies, but not everyone lives. A. Sachs Thanks for all the comments. I really like hearing from people who appreciate what I do. I read the negative ones, too, just don't like them as much. Grin. So to most of you, I say, keep it coming. To the rest, I say, get a life. Some of you have asked why I'm doing this. I am doing it for myself. Let me repeat that. I am doing it for myself. Anyone who says they know what I'll do next is full of shit, because even I don't know what I'll do next. Don't be fooled by the police. They have no clue what to do with me because they have never seen anything like me before. The only thing they have control of is their sound bites. Be skeptical. I can tell you this much. There is more. If that fact pleases you, I can tell you this much again. You won't be disappointed. Keep on living, fuckers. Bree scrolled further down the page. The entries go back a ways, but they're not all this directed. Sometimes he talks about his day, what he had for lunch. It's a little bit of everything. Does he talk about the murders? I asked. Only indirectly. The entries from those days are all like, had a good time tonight and did you see the news? What about these? 
Samson touched the screen where the menu of channel numbers was. Oh, you'll like this. Bree clicked on channel one. The little television screen in the corner switched from static over to a grainy still image. I recognized it as one of the phone camera captures from Matthew J. Walker's murder, taken by someone in the audience and already shown on several news broadcasts. And then there's this. She clicked another one, and an audio file opened. Now the little screen showed a horizontal green line that jumped and spiked with the recorded sound of a woman screaming. I recognized Tess Olson's voice right away. That's her, I said. Definitely? Samson asked. Definitely. Bree and I said it at the same time. We had watched the videotape of her murder so often, the individual modulations of every scream were familiar, like some sick song we knew by heart. The recording that now played had to have been made separately, we realized, given that the video was left behind in the apartment. That fact went a long way toward authenticating this site. Little handheld recorder in the pocket? Easy. There was a kind of grudging respect in Samson's voice. It's all elaborate, but within that he's using the fewest possible strokes. Like a big, efficient machine. Otherwise we'd have his ass in custody, Bree said. He knows how good he is, she grunted in disgust. This was the admiring, hating phase of the game. His methods were undeniably bold and well executed. On the other hand, you can start to hate a killer, and even yourself a little, for every day that he gets to be free in the world. I think all three of us felt it. Well, the good news is that he likes attention, Bree said. I thought that was the bad news, Samson said. Both. They looked at me. He's going to be out there in the world more, which means that his reactivation time could be a lot quicker. But at some point, his confidence is going to outpace his skill. That's when he'll blow it has to happen. Because you say so? Samson asked me with a grin. That's right, I said. I wadded up a page and shot it across the room into the garbage can with a metallic swish. Because I say so. Part 2. Infamous. Chapter 31. The lawyer Mason Wainwright arrived for his meeting with Kyle Craig at four o'clock sharp, as he always did. Kyle insisted that he be punctual, but this visit wasn't to be like any of the past ones. This would be his final time with Kyle Craig, and that was cause for some sadness, but also celebration. He wore his usual cowboy boots and hat, an oversized buckskin jacket, the horn-rimmed glasses, the snakeskin belt, his Far West professorial look. As soon as he entered the 7 by 12 space, he and Kyle hugged as they always did. The beauty of rituals, said Kyle. Everything is ready, the lawyer whispered against the prisoner's cheek. No cameras permitted, we're alone in here. As you know, Washington is underway. Then let's get started here. Nobody will believe this. Nobody. This is greatness, Mason. The two men pulled apart and immediately began to shed their clothing, stripping down to shorts. Kyle's were off-white prison issue with yellow stains. They're not from piss. It's burn marks from the laundry, he told the lawyer. Well, these are from piss. Wainwright laughed as he pointed to his own shorts. That's how frightened I am. Well, said Kyle Craig. I can't really blame you. The lawyer opened his briefcase next. He pried apart the top of the case and took out what first appeared to be molded flesh. Actually, it was a custom-made prosthesis, a realistic face mask originally developed for skin burns and cancer victims, and occasionally used in Hollywood films like Mission Impossible. The mask was made of silicone rubber, and every detail had been hand-painted by a renowned costume artist in Los Angeles. There were two prosthetic applications, one of Mason Wainwright, the other of Kyle Craig. Once the masks were fitted properly, Kyle spoke to the lawyer. Yours looks perfectly fine. 
Very good, actually. And mine, how do I look?